APCO Educational Topic Number 48, Infertility Infertility affects 15% of reproductive age couples in the United States. There are medical, psychosocial, financial, and ethical considerations that are all issues pertaining to the discussion of infertility. This video will discuss infertility from the standpoint of a heterosexual couple, and it is important to recognize that fertility treatments offer the opportunity for parenthood to many non-heterosexual individuals and couples. The objectives of this video are to define infertility and list the causes of male and female infertility. Describe the evaluation and initial management of an infertile couple. Describe the psychosocial issues associated with infertility. Describe management options for infertility. Describe ethical issues confronted by patients with infertility. And lastly, describe the impact of genetic screening and testing on infertility-associated treatments. Let's start with some basic definitions. Infertility is defined as the failure of a couple to conceive after 12 months of frequent unprotected intercourse. Fecundability is the probability of achieving a pregnancy in one menstrual cycle. It is estimated to be 20 to 25% in healthy young couples. After 12 months of unprotected intercourse, 85% of couples will achieve pregnancy. What are the possible causes of infertility? Let's start with the basics. There needs to be production of a good oocyte, and production of a good sperm. The oocyte and sperm need to meet to generate an embryo, and this embryo needs to make it to the uterine cavity and successfully implant into the endometrium. What are the potential causes that negatively affect this process? Male factors account for 20%, female factors account for 65%, and there are unexplained or other conditions in 15%. Let's start with male factors. The male needs to produce a good sperm, thus the evaluation of male infertility involves a semen analysis. It is obtained by masturbation after two to three days of abstinence. A semen analysis evaluates the volume, sperm concentration, motility, rapid progression motility, and normal morphology. If the results are abnormal, then the semen analysis should be repeated, and if persistently abnormal, the male factor should be evaluated by a urologist or reproductive endocrinologist who specializes in male infertility. Let's now move to female factors. First, there needs to be production of a good oocyte. A good history can often help you determine if a woman is ovulating each month. A history of regular predictable mensae suggests ovulatory cycles. Remember that after ovulation, there is an increase in progesterone, and this can cause symptoms such as abdominal bloating, weight gain, and breast tenderness in the luteal phase of the cycle. In addition, the progesterone causes a slight increase in body temperature, so women can monitor their ovulation by checking their daily temperature, which is known as basal body temperature charting. Alternatively, women can purchase ovulation predictor kits, which assess ovulation based on the increased LH production, which can be detected in urine. These ovulation predictor kits can be quite expensive, however. In order to achieve pregnancy, a woman has to ovulate, and she has to ovulate a quality oocyte. Common causes of ovulatory dysfunction in reproductive age women include polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS, thyroid disorders, and hyperprolactinemia. A woman's age also has a significant impact on ovulation and oocyte quality. As a woman ages, unfortunately so do her oocytes. Remember that a female has, at 20 weeks in utero, about 6 to 7 million oocytes, and she is born with about 1 million oocytes. She has about 400,000 at the time of puberty, and there is a more rapid depletion starting at around age 38. Thus, there is a marked reduction in fecundability in a woman's late 30s. Let's now talk about what happens after ovulation. Here's the ovary and the oocyte which gets picked up by the fallopian tube and fertilization occurs in the ampullary portion of the fallopian tube. The embryo will then enter the endometrial cavity approximately five days after fertilization. This process can be impaired if there is damage to the fallopian tube by prior pelvic inflammatory disease or abdominal or pelvic surgeries. A hysterosalpingogram evaluates the fallopian tube patency. For this procedure, contrast dye is injected into the uterine cavity. Note the dark contrast filling the triangular-shaped uterine cavity. If the fallopian tubes are patent, then the dye will travel through both of the tubes. This HSG demonstrates normal fallopian tubes, for the dye travels all the way through both of them. Uterine anomalies are surprisingly uncommon causes of infertility. If there is a history such as abnormal bleeding, pregnancy loss, preterm delivery, or previous uterine surgery, then assessment of the uterus is important. 
Let's now talk about management options. We have to go back to our basic causes of infertility, male factors, female factors, and unexplained or other conditions. In order to optimally try to achieve pregnancy, we need to think about how best to correct any or all of these factors. Ovarian stimulation. These agents will stimulate and effectively improve ovulation. Clomiphene citrate is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, which competes for estrogen receptors at the level of the hypothalamus and pituitary. This leads to increased gonadotropin release from the pituitary, which stimulates increased follicular development from the ovaries. There is an approximate 10% risk of multiple gestations with clomiphene citrate. Similarly, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation with purified human gonadotropin stimulates the ovary to increase follicular development. There is a 25% incidence of multiple gestation with purified gonadotropins. With intrauterine insemination, ejaculated semen is washed to remove prostaglandins, bacteria, and proteins, and suspended in a small amount of medium. A catheter is advanced through the cervix into the uterine cavity. Let's now move to assisted reproductive technologies. In the United States, in vitro fertilization, or IVF, accounts for 99% of all ART procedures. The IVF process involves ovarian stimulation to produce multiple follicles. Then, there will be retrieval of the oocytes from the ovaries. Oocyte fertilization and embryo incubation will occur in the laboratory, and then there will be transfer of embryo or embryos into the woman's uterus through the cervix. There is an approximate 30% risk of multiple gestations with IVF, and this will of course depend on the number of embryos that are implanted into the uterus. The indications for IVF include blocked or absent fallopian tubes, a history of tubal sterilization, severe pelvic adhesions, severe endometriosis, poor ovarian response to stimulation, severe male factor infertility, and failed treatment with less aggressive therapies. The success rates for IVF will depend on the etiology of the infertility. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is the genetic profiling of embryos prior to implantation. For example, if a patient knows that she or her partner is a carrier for a disease such as cystic fibrosis or a Tay-Sachs disease, then the embryo can be tested for this prior to implantation. There are risks to the embryo during the biopsy procedure, which points to the ethical questions of fetal selection. What if a patient desires to have pre-implantation genetic diagnosis performed because they do not want a certain gender child? The discussion of infertility and assisted reproductive technologies should also include the discussion of ethical issues that are confronted both by patients and providers with infertility therapy. Should insurance companies be required to pay for IVF? Should there be an age limit for which IVF should not be offered? There is always the question and costs of higher order multiple births. What about egg banking? Young women can be recruited to donate eggs, and through this process, some argue that women are not counseled adequately about the risks of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And can and should a physician legally and ethically decline ovulation induction for patients with diminished ovarian reserve when chances of successful pregnancy are futile? These questions are complex and many factors, including social class, gender, race, healthcare utilization, and access need to be considered in weighing these complicated decisions. Let's conclude by discussing psychosocial stress associated with infertility. The amount of social support that a patient receives can have significant effects on stress levels. Compared to white and Asian women, black women were less likely to report encouragement for treatment from their partners and family members. It is important to recognize that the psychological stress exists and to determine the patient's support network and help our patients find resources to help them through this process. This concludes the APCO video on infertility. We have described evaluation and initial management of an infertile couple and described the ethical and psychosocial issues associated with this common condition. 